Jesus, that are able to be here today and that we are able to glorify you, Jesus. Thank you so much. And I ask that you give back the right words to preach to every one of us and um, that it makes it clear what you want us to know and to get to know. Thank you so much for everything you do to us and thank you so much that you are here. In Jesus' name, God's people pray. Amen. 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 It's good to see everybody, and it's good to have some visitors today, too. I love having visitors. I'm not going to embarrass the visitors, but we're pretty small. We know who visitors are. <laughs> but, but please say hello to the visitors after church and greet them. You know, don't let people come here and then not be greeted and not feel lost right there. It's important. A big part of church is that we love one another, we encourage one another, and we're there for one another. So it's very important. All right. Today I'm preaching in Acts chapter 13, if you want to turn in your Bibles with me. And I'm starting off with the last verse in 12, 12, 25. All right. All right. I really like that last song we sang. It's the deer pants for the water. Just recently, I really got into that Psalm 42.7, and that's where it is, that Psalm 42.1. It's a deer path for the water, so my soul longs after you. And, uh, and I, uh, the song before, talking about when I die, different things, and so many times we paint death as such a thing that almost doesn't exist. But I tell you what, death is a reality. It happens. Uh, we had death in our own congregation this week. And death is something that's uh, going to happen to every single one of us. There's not one of us that's not going to die. We're all going to die one day. And the main thing that matters is, did we have our faith in Christ alone? That's the most important thing of all life. Where do we place our faith? Where do we place our hope of salvation? If it's anything outside of Christ alone, we're missing everything. It's either we have everything with that, or we've lost everything without that. So it's so important that we hold on to that. And here... Here in uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 25, I, I put a few of the things we're going to learn about here. And one is satanic opposition. Okay, usually we don't have satanic stuff in our church services, all right? But we're going to talk about satanic opposition because we're going to see satanic opposition as soon as the first mission from Paul gets started. That's where we're starting here. Paul's about to go on the first mission field, the three big missions he went on, immediately he had satanic opposition. And he dealt with it accordingly as well. So we're going to see that. And we're going to see the conversion of a man named Sergius Paulus, who was a consul. So he was like appointed by the Romans in this place that's a, a couple days journey away from Jerusalem there, where they start off in the mission field there on the island of Paphos. And... Uh, we're going to see this man gets converted. Okay, so we're going to see salvation. I already gets started with uh, with a Gentile fellow who was a guy who was very intelligent and was in charge. We'll see. All right? And I thought this was a beautiful verse, especially for beginning the mission of Paul. Paul wrote this verse as well. He wrote, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And this is a... a cornerstone verse, I tell you. I didn't have it memorized before, but I'm going to commit it to memory now. Because what a truth is this. If you're going anywhere to something, this church or whatever, but they're not preaching the gospel, woe is that man who stands in the pulpit and does not share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul said as well. He said, that's what he does. He starts off, I thought this was perfect for his mission as well, because he's going off on his first mission, and the main thing is, first big mission, he's already been preaching for a while, but now he's going on these big giant missionary journeys there, and he, the main thing for him was that he's not boasting of anything, because he is under compulsion, because as a preacher, that is what a preacher does, we preach the gospel, and as Christians, that is what we do when we share our faith with others, we preach the gospel to them. Okay, the gospel is basically, you can sum it up in four words, or you can write big giant books about it, but the four easiest words is, Jesus died for me. Okay, and like I said, Christ alone, you know, Jesus died for me. Without Jesus, I have nothing. With Jesus, I have everything. And that is what we're going to see today. And I, and I wrote at the top here, I put no pluralism. 
So often today in our culture, everybody's got to be okay. Every religion is treated okay. We're all treated on some kind of equal level. The Bible does not treat Christianity on an equal level, nor any false religion on an equal level. All right? I am completely exclusivist. Exclusivist means that in Christ alone. Okay? It's not saying that by whatever means or, or religion you are, you're going to be okay in the end. That is not what the Bible says. That is a lie. Okay? And I wrote, it's a life and death reality, and we are really at an all-out war against the forces of hell. All right? Because it really is. It's, I'm telling you, if it's such a big deal, it's Christ alone or nothing, Christ alone or your loss, you know, eternal difference right there in that one thing, that is an all-out war we are against the forces of hell. Because I'll tell you what, you can just turn on the TV, the radio, unless you listen to maybe Moody Radio or something, and all you're going to hear is all kinds of things saying how all kinds of ways are okay and fine, and this is how you can live like this and live like that, and... The only time it seems like it's an issue is when it's a Christianity issue. Because people know Christianity preaches Christ alone. And they don't want to tolerate that. In fact, people even tolerate a lot of Muslim stuff these days. And yet Muslims are very exclusivist as well. Okay, <laughs> And yet they're okay. But why is it? It's because one is truth and one is a lie. And a lie is easily bought and sold everywhere. <coughs> truth, truth is not. Truth, truth comes with friction right there. And, uh, and we're going to see this. As soon as they started off their mission, it, didn't, it wasn't some nice chipper day where everything went well. We're going to see some big troubles happen as soon as they started off in the big mission. But here in Acts chapter 12, verse 25, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Okay, so Barnabas and Saul... All right, are, 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 are going back, okay, to the, to the church in Antioch. That's where these guys are going, the church in Antioch, and they're taking with them John, who is also called Mark. This is the same Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark, all right? This is the same Mark who later Paul has an issue with. We'll see that in the bird are preaching today. But this was, uh, this was Mark that uh, was with Jesus and everything, all right? And so Barnabas and Saul. And here it says, now they were at Antioch, at Antioch in the church there was there, there was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manin, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So we're seeing five teachers are in the church at Antioch, right? And as we saw before, the church in Antioch was really exploding. People were coming to believe it was the first big Gentile church. It's really where the church got started at, as we know it today, all right? It's outside the temple. It was at Antioch, all right? And there's five teachers there. It lists who they are. There's a lot of debate. You know, I can't give you a clear answer, but the, the Simeon, who is called Niger, Niger means black, all right? And then it talks about Lucius Cyrene. And we remember that the man who carried Jesus' cross was a black man when Jesus fell down. And most people believe that this Simeon was called Niger was him. So this man, not only did he carry Jesus' cross when Jesus was trying to struggle to get up there to the, to the place where he was crucified, carrying his cross after he was beaten, but the man that helped him later becomes a teacher of the word. All right, you know, gets, gets saved from, from being in the presence of Jesus and seeing all this kind of stuff. Can we say that absolutely for sure? We can't say absolutely for sure. But a lot of people believe, you know, this, this could be that man right there. All right, and then notice too this guy, Manian. He was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, okay? That's the guy who, uh, who was around back in Jesus' day right there. Because there's a lot of different Herods. So this guy was brought up amongst a guy who is not a believer, okay? I don't say any of the Herods were believers, okay? You know, one killed John the Baptist. You know, one did this, one did that. They weren't up. Uh, one got killed by God in the last preaching a couple of days ago. We got eaten up by worms when he made himself out to be God. That was Herod Agrippa, though, not Herod the Tetrarch. But here we can see this guy was raised up with Herod the Tetrarch. So he was probably raised up with royalty. He was raised up in a place that was not in a Christian place, okay? It wasn't a place that was following God, and yet this man had come to know the Lord, and he was also a teacher, all right? And a teacher at this first church in Antioch. And we're going to see, out of these five teachers, they're going to select two of them to go on to the mission field to bring the gospel out. And you know what two they're going to pick? The top two. They're going to pick Barnabas and Saul. And think about this, think about this. If we, if we were going to go do a mission, 
would we send our top two people out? You know, think about like a big company or something. You know, the big company would probably find some people and send them out. The way the church worked then was the top fellows, the guys that probably were the best teachers, was who they sent to go out. It wasn't, you know, they weren't sending their second best. They weren't sending like, you know, let's, let's get some good guys and send them out. They sent their best. And that was Barnabas and Saul to go out there on the mission field. And it says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So, you can see what they're doing. They're, what are they doing? They're ministering to the Lord and fasting. Now that means that when we pray, when we read our scriptures, when we're obeying God, we're not doing that for somebody else. We're doing that for God. Okay? We're not ministering to somebody else. We're not fasting for somebody else. We are fasting for the Lord. We're ministering to Him. So really, fasting, reading your scripture, obeying the Lord, it's not something you're doing as a work for someone else. It's something you're doing for God Himself. All right? It puts a whole new light on it right there. All right? It's not like I'm trying to earn points or do this or do that. I am serving the Lord by doing these kind of things. I'm serving the Lord when I fast. I'm serving the Lord when, when, when I pray. We're, we're serving God when we do this, okay? It's not for anybody else, but for God alone. And it says that the Holy Spirit spoke. Now, how did he speak? Maybe he spoke to one of those prophets. It said they had prophets and teachers, all right? But he says, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. <clears throat> so God chose the two best teachers there. The two out of five teachers in Antioch that we just read about, the two best are chosen by God, the Holy Spirit, to go forth to the mission field. All right? They were called to the mission field. They were called to be sent out. And it says, Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. All right? So they're... They're on the mission field, and they headed out, and what did they do before them? They fasted, they prayed, and they had hands laid on them. Let me tell you about the laying on of hands, all right? The laying on of hands symbolizes God's touch on your life, okay? Now, we God, no, we are not God. But when we, as a believer, put our hand on somebody else, that is symbolizing the touch of God. And I can tell you what. I've been working this chaplaincy stuff now for some weeks. You guys have bore with me as I'm putting an awful lot of hours in there. And when I'm in those hospital rooms, there's times when somebody's crying real bad, or they're broken, or they're suffering, or whatever's going on, you know, whether it's mental or whether it's physical. And I go in there and I ask them, hey, can I lay my hand on you and pray for you? It changes the room. It changes everything, all right? In fact, there was just a woman this week, uh, a older, older black woman, and she was just sobbing and sobbing because she had all these problems in her life and her heart was messed up. And I put my hand on her shoulder and prayed for her, and she calmed down. And then at the end, I prayed for her. And then I asked her, how are you doing now? And she said, you know what? Since you first put your hands on me and prayed for me, it started to get better. And I'm thinking, that's not for me. That's from God right there. That's a, it's like symbolizes the touch of God and prayer. And I tell you what, I can't tell you how many times I'm blessed as a chaplain working in a secular place where I can't necessarily just preach Jesus unless it opens up for me, which it does about a third of the time I'm going to get going in there. But I can always say, can I pray for you? And when I pray and I lay my hands on folks and things, you can see that the Spirit of God is working. It's moving. And I tell you, it's something that we ought to be doing more for one another. In fact, as I read about this this week, it said in the older days, like 100 years ago, it used to be with small churches, which we still have a pretty small church, is that the pastor would put his hand on each person and pray for them personally before everything moved on or whatever, you know, the church service. So that's beautiful. One time... Uh, John Barber sitting back there. I watched him pray about prayer, and he prayed for everybody in the church afterward. It did go for a long time, but man, is the power of prayer strong right there. And that's what we ought to be doing. We should be laying hands on folks, praying for folks, and it's what they did in the Bible. It's what we should be doing as well. And don't think that like you have to not touch somebody. It's not bad touch. It's a good touch, right? Just touch your shoulder or something. All right, so these guys are sent out by the, uh, by the Holy Spirit. It says, when they reached Salamis, 
They began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. All right? Remember John Mark. So this is Mark, who's their helper. All right? All these guys have, like, different names. All right? Some of them had, like, three names back then. That's how they looked at it there. All right? So they first went to the Jews, and they what did they always do was proclaim the Bible. All right? So they first went to the Jews, because there were a lot of Jews that were kind of scattered off, you know, they immigrated and went out to the farther lands right there. And then what were they doing all the time? Proclaiming the Word of God. Just like that first Bible scripture I put up. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. All right? They weren't going in there talking about a bunch of social issues or trying to make people happy or just make people feel good. They're proclaiming the Word of God. And I tell you what, you know, we talk about feel good stuff and everything. There is not a time that I feel better listening to preaching when it's not truly the Word of God. You know, if I'm listening to somebody talk and it's a nice talk, I might enjoy it because it may be handy or helpful for something, but I don't get joy as much as I do is hearing the Word of the Lord proclaimed, is hearing the Bible preached. Okay? It just doesn't do it. You know, it doesn't connect us. It doesn't bring us to that point of reality of the pure, pure Word of God. You know, it says in Timothy 3.16, that the Word of God was breathed out. You know, it's the inspiration of God. You know, if you look at that, to break it down in the words, it's it's that the, the vocal cords of God, the wind has passed through, and those words have been preached out, and every word that's in our Bible has come straight from the mouth of God. Amen. So that's a powerful book right there. When we have a Bible that's 100% God's Word, not man's Word, but God's Word, that is powerful right there. And that's what they do. They come here with the power. If we don't come with the power of God, we're really wasting our time. You know, really, this is what it's all about. So they first went to the Jews, and they had uh, they proclaimed the Bible. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar Jesus. All right, Bar Jesus translated in our language means son of Jesus, and yet this is a false prophet, and his name is the son of Jesus. All right. Son of salvation, because that's what Jesus means, like Joshua, salvation, all right? Son, son of Jesus is this guy's name, and yet it says he's a magician. If you go into Deuteronomy, if you go into Leviticus, you go into these old books of Moses, it says that if you're a magician, you're a sorcerer, you're a psychic, you're whatever, that you are an abomination to God, and that you're a false prophet, and that you should be killed. It was the death penalty. So this guy is named Son of Jesus, and yet he's a magician, all right, probably telling these guys, yeah, you'll win if you do this, or you'll win if you do that. Oh, let me tell you what I see in your future. This is evil. In fact, as we've been reading through the Bible, I notice in Deuteronomy 13, it says that even if a false prophet's actions or prophecies come to pass, but they don't line up with the Word of God, they're a false prophet. They're still to be stoned, even if things they say come true. And I see sometimes I talk to folks with psychics or different things, and like, oh, but this came true, or this was so strange. Well, the devil can look at things. The devil's been around for a long time, and so have the demons. And they can look at things the way they play out, and they can say, you know what? With the way things are stepping out like this, this is what's going to happen. And they can speak that to you, and you can say it, and they can say it, and it may seem like, what an astonishment. How did they know that? Well, they've been around a long time. They know a lot of things. But it says in the Bible, if they say anything that contradicts the Bible, it's a false prophet. You're not supposed to listen to them. They will be stoned. And it also says in Deuteronomy 19 that if they had one false prophecy, they were to be stoned. Because if God makes someone a prophet, they are going to be a perfect prophet. Because it's coming from God. It's not coming from themselves. All right? So I just want to point that out. This is the background on this guy, Bar Jesus, that they run into. All right, says that he who was with the proconsul. So he's hanging out with the head boss guy, the people that the Romans appointed. Okay, this guy named Bar Jesus, the the magician, Sergius Paulus, is named the proconsul, and it says he's a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. All right, so this is it. I think it points out specifically on purpose. He's a man of intelligence. It's trying to show this wasn't just a guy that gets to see a miracle later. So we're going to see a miracle later happen here and just believe because of a miracle. This is a guy who was a thinker. This was an intellectual type of guy. This was a guy that really wanted to see what's going on and he wasn't going to be fooled from some hocus pocus. I mean, yeah, he did have the magician hanging out by his side. 
You know, he's probably interested in what's going on with him. But now he wants to hear the word of God. And that's what he wanted to bring him for. What was their whole purpose? To proclaim the word of God. Because what did Paul say later in Corinthians? Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. All right? So this is what the whole setting is pictured out right now. Okay? So they got the mission field. You know, there's three of them. There, there's uh, Saul, Barnabas, and, and John, or Mark we could call them, because we know the gospel, Mark by Mark. And they just came in to meet the head boss of the island of Paphos, one of the head men, and his right-hand man is a magician sorcerer named Son of Jesus, all right? And the guy's a very intelligent man, and he wants to hear the word of God. He wants to hear what these guys have come from afar to say. And it says, but Elimus, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith, all right? Now you're like, who is this Elimus, all right? So it says in parentheses right there. That is the transliteration name in Arabic for magician, okay? So the magician was opposing them, okay? The right-hand man of the proconsul, Bar-Jesus, who's the magician, was opposing them, and he was seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. He didn't want to follow what these guys were saying. You know, maybe it took away from power from him. Maybe he was somebody special on that day, because he's the right-hand man, and now... He's being told by these guys, and he realizes he's a false prophet. He's a false guy, and he's about to be exposed. So he's upset, he's mad, and he's trying to convince this guy, don't even listen to these guys. Don't even listen to it, all right? So he's trying to turn them actively away from the faith. Let's see what Paul does. Let's see how Paul deals with this. Does he do some nice, gentle, loving, hey, brother, let me talk to you out here in the back room, and... Just whisper some things to you. No, no. We're going to see something that is not done often today in today's churches and things. We're going to see what happens here with Paul and how he deals with this. But Saul, who is also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him. I could just imagine Paul gazing at me. All right? <laughs> I think I might be like, whoa. <laughs> Here's a man that's following God with all of his heart, is an apostle of God, and he stops and he's filled up with the Holy Spirit. So he's not filled with rage. He's not filled with anger, or unrighteous anger at least. He's not filled with any kind of sinful things or things about himself. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And he stops and he gazes right at him. And he's looking at him, the magician, who is trying to turn away the proconsul from hearing the word of God, all right? And uh, and then I put a little side note here too. Paul was Saul's Gentile name, and he was filled with the Spirit. You know, not necessarily was Paul, Saul's name changed to Paul when he was saved in conversion. Saul's name was probably, Gentile name was Paul as well, okay? Because they had like these three different names and all this kind of different stuff. So while he's going out to the Gentiles, he's not going by his Hebrew name Saul, which was an honorable name. It was the name of the first king, King Saul, for the Hebrews and everything. He is going by his name, Paul. And from here on out in the Bible, this is the only way we're going to hear the Saul referred to as Paul, except for one or two times when, when uh, he talks about his testimony. But we just hear about him as called Paul. And from here on out in the book of Acts, it's all going to be about Paul. So we're going to see a lot of stuff on Paul here. But he's filled up with the Holy Spirit. And I want to point that out too. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's something that should be happening on a daily basis for every single one of us. I thoroughly believe that it says, I believe it's in Romans 8, 9, or 9, 8, 8, 9. It says that if you are baptized in the Spirit of Christ, you have Spirit of Christ. I believe every single born-again believer has the Holy Spirit. You've been baptized in the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, then you're not saved. You're not born again. But if you have the Spirit, you have the Spirit. But yet many times in the book of Acts, we also see that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. So we keep getting filled up. We can keep getting more filled up. And how do we get filled up with the Spirit? By spending time in the Bible. By spending time in prayer. By spending time fellowshipping with one another, encouraging one another in the Lord. We can get filled up with the Spirit. And He is filled with the Spirit right now. And He's gazing on this guy who's trying to, uh, to block his mission of preaching the Gospel. He's trying to hinder this one guy from getting saved and being born again. To being, uh, to being swayed back to the way that he was, all right? So he says to him, this is what Paul says, and he said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? So the guy's name is, is, is Bar-Jesus, means son of Jesus. What does Paul rename this guy? 
son of the devil. That's what he calls him. Can you imagine this? If uh, you saw some false teaching going on somewhere, and you said, you son of the devil. Oh, man. There'd be all kinds of trouble. They'd be escorting you out real quick, right? They'd be all upset with you. But this is what Paul did, and he did it to the top man, the consul's right-hand man, the magician, who's called the son of Jesus, who was a Jewish guy as well, but a false prophet, and he tells him, you are full of all deceit and fraud. Who's the father of lies? The devil's the father of lies. So what does he call him? He calls him a son of the devil. And he says he's an enemy of all righteousness. And then he says, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Will you not stop doing your evilness right now, right here? And this is in front of everybody. This wasn't like, let me take you to the side, like... Uh, I read about, there's a book that's written uh, about how to be friendly and, and win friends and different things. This definitely wasn't from that guy's advice, okay? This guy was direct. He was there, and this wasn't Paul on some kind of mean tangent or some kind of fellow that shouldn't be talking bad about somebody else and be respecting everybody. This was Paul filled with the Holy Spirit speaking what God wanted him to say to this man in front of everybody, all right? So he's calling the guy out. And there's a story of two I read, I thought, I don't know if you guys ever seen these Max McLean plays. He comes and makes the C.S. Lewis plays in Cleveland, and uh, he makes a lot of Christian plays on Broadway and things like that, and really brings out the Christian message. Well, he once did a play on uh, Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God that he made, okay? And that, and that sermon that Jonathan Edwards made, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God, it frustrated people in the 1800s when he made it. And it still makes people angry today. But he made this play like this, and people were furious with him. They're like, that's not the loving God I serve. He doesn't send anybody to hell. And I thought, well, you, after I read that, thought, that person obviously never read the Bible. Because when you read the Bible, there is justice. And we all want justice. A God of love is also a God of justice. A God of justice is not going to let things go. A God of justice holds us all accountable 100%. Okay? There's, if we think, we all want justice. If something there happened to one of our little kids or something, and we were to go to court and the judge would say, you know, don't worry about it. I got an example. One of the chaplains I was with, the poor man was in the psych ward some year ago. He was a policeman, and some guy jumped up and had a knife stashed in his underwear where they didn't think he had a knife on him, stabbed this guy seven times. One of the stabbings actually punctured his heart seven times. You know, it's a 56 year old man. Police officer, been that way his whole life, gets stabbed from this psychotic fellow seven times, and then he survives, grace of God, I think, to save this man. He's born again Christian as well. And then he said, I said, well, what happened to that guy? He said he got five years in jail. I'm like, five years in jail? The guy stabbed you seven times and punctured your heart. But they're like, well, we couldn't charge him with attempted murder because he was in the hospital. This is awful right there. That's not justice. We don't want justice. Imagine this man is a forgiving man. He told me he already forgave this guy who did that to him. He forgave him, and it took him a long time. He had to work at it. But imagine if he had not made it. Imagine if he had died. I mean, he now walks with a certain walk. He's not the same man he used to be. It's changed his life forever. Five years isn't really justice. If that had been your kid, if somebody had died, you'd be upset. But God is a God of justice. All righteousness says that it says that He deals things out. He makes things straight. And we can believe 100%. It says, it says Jesus even said, every single word we speak, every thought we think, every single thing we have will be held accountable one day. All right? And that's either going to be, well, we can all think that. You know what? Every one of us should think, well, I am guilty. Because there's not one of us that's righteous. The Bible says in Romans 3.20, there's none righteous, no, not one. Not one of us is going to make it because we're a good person. But the only way we're going to make it is what I said in the beginning, in Christ alone. Because he went to the cross, he paid the price, he stretched out his hands and died, and felt the wrath of God, he felt the punishment for the sin that we deserve, and he paid for it in full, 100%. So we're still getting justice because somebody else paid for the wrath for us. But it didn't pay for the wrath for those who don't believe, alright? Just read John chapter 3. Read John 3.16, for whomsoever believeth, you know, these things are accounted to. It says, for those who don't believe, in the same chapter, they are already condemned. Okay, they remain condemned until they believe. So everybody's going to get justice. Rather, your justice was paid for by Jesus, or you'll pay justice on your own. And Paul, 
And it sounds mean, him calling this guy son of the devil and everything, and what he's going to do to him next, and what the Holy Spirit's going to do to the guy next. But let's just hope maybe the guy repented later. Okay? It's much better. I'd much rather have someone speak truth to me than just leave me be. I'd rather not, like, say if you at your job, and you mess up at your job or something, and people all kind of watch you and look at you, and you don't really connect with it. You think, why are they looking at me this way, this or that? And then the next day, they give you a thing and say, you know what, you're fired. You just lost your job. We'd be like, well, what? Wouldn't we all rather have somebody say, you know what, you messed up. We don't like what you did. And you say, I'm sorry. Won't do that again. Tell me what was the right way. And you go forward. That's what we want. You know, you know we want... We want to have somebody help us, someone stand in. So Paul being saying these things is actually a blessing as well to this guy. All right? It says here, it's another verse on the side, because I want to show you too that it's not just Paul that's so harsh. All right? Some people try to point Paul as a bad guy in the Bible, and yet he wrote half the New Testament. I don't know how you can look at Paul as a bad guy when 13 of the 26 books is written by Paul. But Jesus also said these kind of things. It says, Jesus said in Matthew 18, 6, he said, But whosoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. These are the words of Christ. Jesus wasn't some loving God that people try to pretend like a loving God different. God is love. He is amazing love. He is love beyond what we can imagine. But this world's picture of love is false and wrong. Because the world doesn't even want that kind of love themselves. The world wants justice themselves. They don't want something not to go just if something happens to one of their family members or something. But Jesus said, it's better to be a millstone. I don't know if you've seen a millstone. On my street, somebody has a millstone right by their mailbox. Fortunately, nobody's ran it over or hit it yet. But it's a giant millstone. And that's just a little one compared to, I think, the ones you see otherwise. It says, better for that thing to be hung around your neck and thrown in the ocean than what God's going to do to you after you try to lead somebody away from Him. You know, so this is, this is Jesus. And they, these are the words of Christ. And this is Paul, who knows the words of Christ as well, all right, who's, who's Christ's apostle. And he sees this guy trying to stop this other man from hearing the gospel and getting saved, all right? And we can see that Jesus spoke very strongly, and sometimes we knew to as well. Now, usually when you look at Jesus, if somebody knew they were in sin, like the woman caught in adultery or the woman at the well, he didn't jump all over them. He didn't call them bad things. He didn't call them sons of hell and different things. He showed them love, and he brought them to salvation, okay? And he dealt one way with some people, another way with other people. With the Pharisees, sons of hell. They were the highest priests of the day. They were the most respected in the Jewish religion. And he called them sons of hell right to their faces, all right? So Jesus also did what we see what Paul's doing here. But it's not something we're going to go out. I don't want you to go out and every person you meet this week you call them a son of hell or son of the devil, all right? Don't do that. But there may be times when you're in a conversation, when you're talking to somebody, that, that is appropriate, all right? But you better be filled with the Spirit. Don't be filled up with yourself and you just want to be right. It's okay. If you think it's because you want to be right, you, that's not the spirit, okay? We've got to humble ourselves. And if it's because of God doing something right there, sometimes it may be proper to call somebody out right there in their sin, all right? But you make sure that you're filled with the spirit and you're following the Lord. Just don't do that to everybody you meet. I'm trying to point that out too. I don't want to I don't want to overemphasize this portion of scripture here, and then you guys go out there and, and make a lot of enemies. We want to we want to make friends and bring them to Jesus, but we also want to be ready to stand in the truth as well. So we back to Acts 13. It says, Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. So this right-hand magician who probably lived like a king since he was right next to the head king type of guy in the area, is now blind and wandering around and can't even see the sun. I mean, that's extreme. Imagine, I think even a blind guy, if I was looking with my eyes closed, I could see where the sun is. You know, you can see that bright light. This guy couldn't see a thing. Pitch blackness is what God did to him for what he was trying to do by stopping the preaching of the Word of God. Now, that is powerful right there. But also, it's God's mercy. Because it says for a time, all right? It was mercy. Imagine it wasn't mercy. He could have been blind for the day he died. You know, this gives us some kind of a hope where we maybe can, can look into it and wonder and think, well, maybe this guy repented one day and came to Jesus. Maybe this 
blinding of him was such a wake-up reality that he did repent and come to Jesus later, and God opened up his eyes again. We don't know. doesn't talk anymore about it. But we can, it does say that in uh, some, some extra-type, biblical-type things like Josephus and different things. But we don't know for sure, but it is only for a time, all right? And we can see how much Paul loved the lost, all right? In fact, Paul loved the lost so much that he died for the lost, okay? Paul's third missionary trip, he didn't make it home after that third trip. They killed him. If you read 2 Timothy, Paul's last book that he wrote, he's in prison, he's cold, and, uh, and he's just asking for his coat and the scriptures that he's written. Please bring them back to me. And that was it. And the tradition says that Paul was killed. And he, he was thrown in prison. He was beaten. He was bitten by poisonous snakes. He had all kinds of terrible stuff happen to him. And could he have just lived a fine life because he was a, a Pharisee of Pharisees himself? Before all this, he sure could have. But he chose to go and do what the Lord had called him to do and be obedient. And it wasn't some pretty picture life. It was kind of a horrible life. If we look at it from our standard, and we were reading about Paul in the paper, we would be like, oh no, Paul's in prison now. Paul got whipped 39 times, a total of five times. Paul had this happen, Paul had that happen. Oh, now Paul got killed. We would think that's terrible what happened to Paul. But yet, you know what? Paul said he was most joyful. He was so filled with joy in his life during all those times because he knew he had Christ alone right there. He knew that he had it all. And that meant so much more to him than anything this life could have given him. And we're still reading about it 2,000 years later, all right? So it says, Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Okay? Now, this is a debatable point right here, but I would say the proconsul, this guy, uh, Paul, Paulus there, Sergius Paulus, he didn't believe because he just saw the blinding of this man that's his right-hand man. Man, it says right here, he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. It was the scripture. It was the word of God that saved this man, okay? Because if you're relying on a miracle to happen all the time, then that may or may not be. But I tell you what, with the Bible, that will always be. You've got the word of God, you have it right there, and that is a miracle in itself. When you teach the Bible, it does things to people. It penetrates people. It is the Word of God. It says it is the living Word of God. It's not just a book. It's not just something that's history and written down. It is alive. It's alive and it can seep into every single human being and touch them in their heart. In fact, there is nobody that lives today that can't open up the Bible and start to read it and find themselves within its pages. And be Amen. like, this is talking about me. This is directly on me. Oh my gosh, do I connect with this? Because it's a living Bible. And when you open up that Bible and you teach it, it should cut through to people right there. It's what changes people. It's not us. Okay, it's not man. We could be some clever fella and do something, but it's just going to be a temporary fix. I think about, too, with all this hospital stuff, I see a lot of people depressed or psychotic or different things. And yes, the doctors can give them some medicine. They can help them a little bit. But if you look at their record, they're back in over and over and over again for the same issues. It's so just like a band-aid on a shotgun wound. It's just a temporary fix. The real fix we need is Jesus Christ inside our heart. Now, is anything bad with medicine? No. Don't stop taking your medicine because I say that. Praise God for medicine and these different discoveries and things that God enables us to see and to learn and to use. But it's not enough. What we need is we need Jesus Christ. It's like even I keep going to the hospital. It's the reason for chaplains. Is the chaplain is the spiritual caretaker. We people realize even in the secular world that we need to have a spiritual caretaker because there's something more than just the body. There's something more than just the medicine and different things and what we can see, what we can touch. There's the person that's within, and they need to be seen, they need to be touched, and they need that touch of the Lord God Almighty. All right? So that's what he, he saw these things. And now it says in the last verse, it says, Now Paul and his com companions put out to sea from Paphos, and came to Persia and Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. All right? This is a big point of contention right here. Okay, Later, when they're going to get ready to go on the second missionary trip, uh, Paul's like, I don't want him going with us. I don't ever want to work with Mark anymore. He was a quitter, and I don't want to quit around me. And I can totally understand yeah. that. When I was in the Army, the biggest thing of all the special forces and different things I went through, it was to see if a guy would quit. If a guy would quit, you didn't want him out there on the mission field with you because he'd be a liability to you rather than an asset, all right? 
And that's why Paul felt against, how uh, he felt against him. And yet Barnabas, the guy he's with, was a man of compassion, a son of encouragement, is what Barnabas' name was. He's like, no, no, I want to give him another chance. I know this guy, I want to give him another chance. And thank God for guys like Barnabas. We all need a Barnabas, all right? Every one of us needs a Barnabas. None of us are going to be perfect, okay? We probably all would have disappointed Paul eventually. <laughs> but, but here is the thing, is, is that it's what causes a split. But you know what? When you see these kind of splits, you know, it ends up in that second missionary journey we'll be preaching in a little while here, is they see a whole bunch of fruit, a whole bunch of people get saved, and so does Paul in the direction he goes, okay? So God's splitting them up, doing more things. And uh, we don't know why Mark left, okay? People suppose different things. Maybe it was too tough. Maybe it was too scary for him. Maybe it was just too much for him. I don't know what it was. We don't know. But we can know later that Paul and him were friends again. Because Paul talks about it down there in the second book of Timothy once again in a very kindly way. All right? In a way that he's like, he loves, he loves John Mark. All right? So, so he forgives them and they come back together again. So they don't have that dispute to the day they die. All right? And, uh... And that's what happened there. Now, in conclusion, we'll talk about what we talked about. We should send our best to missions. All right? They sent their best to missions. We should send our best to missions, too. All right? There are times when real love means calling things the way they are. All-out war against the forces of hell. That's real love. All right? There's going to be times we're going to run into with somebody, and we're going to just have to tell them the blatant, honest truth. Like, yes, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell. You know, yes, this is the only way. Yes, that Jesus died for your sins, and he was a substitute for you on the cross. And if you don't believe that, then you are not covered by the cross, all right? Then you are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven, all right? There will come a time with almost anybody, as you're sharing the truth with them, that that has to be said. Now, I, I've seen some services and places where it's like people are like, wow, did that feel good? It was so amazing. And we talked all about this and that. And I'm like, did you talk about repentance? And they're like, no, not in a bit, not a bit. And all these people got saved. And I'm thinking, how could anybody get saved if they don't know they need a Savior? Okay? Until we realize that we are desperately wicked and lost without Jesus Christ, there's no way any of us are going to get saved. Because we're going to think that we're good enough and our works are going to be good enough to get us into the kingdom of heaven. And that's not true whatsoever. You just read the book of Romans, read chapter 3, it just makes it all out clear. Even the Psalms make that clear. Nobody can get there on their own. Okay? Nobody is righteous. Christ alone is righteous right then. We need His righteousness upon us. Alright? And uh, we also need to be filled with the Spirit and preach the Bible. And I learned something today that I thought was so handy and nice. We had a little Sunday school and John Barber was there. And he said, he goes, first you have to do, he said, four things you got to remember. I think I'm going to try to remember these four things. They were excellent. Alright? He said, you got to open the Bible. Alright? Let me give you a, a demonstration here. I got the Bible right here. You got to open this Bible up right here, okay? Then you got to study that Bible, okay? You got to read it, take your time, read it again, think about it, ponder it, and how, what happens when you study something? You'll learn it, okay? That's the third point. Open, study, learn, and then the fourth point is the best of all live it, all right? We got to live this Bible, all right? If we are doing those four things, that's the recipe for a good life right there, okay? Doesn't matter what else happens in our life, if we've got the Bible, and then we're studying it, we're learning and we're living it, we're golden. And then, he even said, he pointed out, I tell you, this is like a little, little Sunday school for me this morning. He said, and then one day you're going to meet the author of this book. Because that's what we're going to meet. The day we die, we are present with Christ. As Paul said, if I am absent from the body, I am present with the Lord. That's immediate. There's no like soul sleep or crazy stuff or purgatory or anything like that. The Bible says that at, 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 uh, there was one death and then the judgment. There's no reincarnation. There's no time for karma to work its way out or any kind of this other foolishness right there. It says, if we're absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. So one day we're going to meet the author of this book. All right. And the only way I want to meet the author of this book is because I've been righteous by him. Because let me tell you, if you don't live a life for Christ, if you haven't been changed for Christ, and you die, that's going to be the most terrifying moment in your life when you meet your maker. Because every single thing you've ever done, you will be judged for. Because he's a God of justice, and how unjust would he be if he let all those things go that you did against everybody else, and just said, oh, don't worry about it, you're okay. That's not the way God is. He's in perfection. He's just. And the only way we could ever be reconciled back to him 
was because Jesus Christ died on that cross and paid for our sins, all right? So, then I also put here, we minister to God, not man, all right? When we minister and stuff, we shouldn't be thinking, I've got to please all these people, I've got to make everybody happy. We are serving God, okay? When you pray, when you fast, when you talk about God, you're doing it not just for somebody else, you're doing it for God. When doing it for God, it should be done in such a good way that it will really bless that other person, okay? But it's not for others, it's for God is what you're doing, okay? He's your rewarder right there, okay? Man can't reward you like God can reward you. And then I wrote, are we trusting in Christ alone? we got to check these things once in a while. Maybe look in the mirror, think about things as we read the Bible, and think, where is my faith at? Is my faith in that I'm a good person, that I go to church, that I do this and that? Or is my faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me? That's where it needs to be. So we got to kind of check ourselves sometimes, and that's an important question to ask ourselves. And then I put to, are you filled with the Spirit? All right. If you read through the book of Acts and other places in the Bible, man, they get filled all the time. If you're never being filled, man, you need to get filled. Follow the recipe. There really is a recipe. Open the book, study it, learn it, live it. That's the recipe for how to be filled up with the Spirit. And I tell you, when you're filled with the Spirit, sometimes it feels pretty good. Sometimes when you're filled with the Spirit, you feel that joy that no matter how bad things have gotten, you are so happy and so joyful because nothing else can bring you to that point. Not like a new car or, or a good job or this or that. It is the most. Okay, it's everything. Think about this too. Think about these missionaries that some people see, they go out, they have maybe doctor educations, PhDs, they get all this stuff, and then they go out to some third world country where the natives kill them as soon as they get there within a few weeks. All right, and people think, what a waste. That guy was so efficient. He had so much. He could have done so much here in America. But that wasn't a waste. It wasn't a waste whatsoever. Not one single drop was that a waste. Because they were doing what the Lord called them to do. And if you look at some of these things where these guys got killed and murdered as soon as they hit the mission field, another guy comes in and steps in too because he's not afraid and he's wanting to follow the Lord. And next thing you know, the whole nation of the people are following the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was all together, working together, evil things, whatever. God used it together for the good, all right? And we even see God uses it the best when he sent them the missions. He didn't send them the guy that doesn't know anything to speak to the people who don't know anything. He sent them the most high Pharisee of Pharisees, the most trained man out there to go in the jungle in the bush. And Paul met guys like that. Think about when he got off of the got off the shipwreck of the boat and all the wild natives are there. And there's these bringing sticks to start the fire, a wild serpent bites him on the arm that would usually kill an old man, and the natives were like, you know what, this guy is cursed by God for sure. He just got off a shipwreck and survived, and now he gets bit by a poisonous snake, and Paul whips a snake into the fire, and he's fine because God healed him, because God kept him safe right there, and then they try to worship him, and he says, no, no, don't you dare worship me, all right? But there's the kind of thing that goes on, and these were kind of people who probably didn't know a whole lot of things. They probably couldn't read, they probably weren't educated, and yet it was God's will to have Paul, this guy who had done all these things, to go there, to be with them, to bring them the word of God. And God didn't bring him there in a nice way. I mean, he was a prisoner while he was on that boat, all right? Then he's getting bit by a poison snake. That'd be painful. Even if you don't die, some snake bite puts bangs into your arm. Serious pain Paul was going through. And yet he did it for God. And what God used it for was for a blessing for him. All right, so if you guys will bow your heads, we're going to go ahead and pray. And then we're going to get ready to take communion. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for each and every person here today, Lord. Lord, help us to be, be like Paul. Help us, Lord, to, 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 to follow you, to, to obey you. Help us, Lord, to be the true disciples of you. Help us, Lord, to not get caught up with all the day ins and day outs and different things that we do, Lord, and forget you. Help us, Lord, to wake up with prayer on our mind, Lord, with thankfulness to you. Help us to pray to you through the day when we run into rough times or hard times. Help us, Lord, to find time in the day to open up your word, to listen to it, to read it to study it, Lord, and to learn it, Lord. Help us to live our lives for it, Lord. Help us as we go to bed at night, to go to bed at night, calling out to you, praising you, talking to you, Lord. Help us, Lord, as we dream, to have dreams about you, Lord, to, 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 to rest in your peace, 
Help us to be able to have peace like Peter had. He was in that prison cell about to be killed the next day or two, and yet he slept so sound the angel had to strike him to wake him up, Lord. Lord, give us this peace. Give us this joy and help us, Lord. Make us aware of our own selves, Lord. Make us aware of our own realities, Lord. Help our perceptions be your perceptions, Jesus. And Lord, I ask that you strengthen each and every person here today. And Lord, if there happen to be any person here today who does not know you, who is not born again, Lord, Lord, I ask you, Lord, that you, that you draw them by your spirit, that they would realize that they are hopeless without you. Lord, that they'd beat their chest and they'd say, have mercy on me, a sinner, and that you would save that person, Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask that you be with us all, Lord. For those of us who are Christians, that you strengthen us. For those who are not, that you draw us, Lord God. And Lord, I ask that you bless us and, and help us, Lord, as, as we get ready to partake of this communion, Lord. Remember what you have done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, now we got some communion here. I'm going to pass it out. Oh, you got a 